Hi, you're listening to Bonus Point, the official podcast of Mr. Astro's Theology Class. Join us as we put out into the deep and explore the world of theology and beyond. Today, we're talking about interesting, weird, and otherwise cool patron saints. Let's begin. Well, welcome to another episode of Bonus Points, and this episode is going to be another entry in the Communion of Saints series that we've been coming back to every now and then. Back in episode 12, we started the series by talking about why we venerate saints. Um, If you remember, we don't worship saints, but we do venerate them. We do have a lot of respect for them, and we do ask for their intercession. Then we talked about the canonization process in episode 13, how a saint becomes a saint. And after that, we talked about relics, the physical remains of saints, in episode 18. Today, we're talking about the concept of patron saints, and then we're going to look at some of the strange ones. As always, make sure you subscribe and share this episode and the show. Check out our website, bonuspointspodcast.com, and there you can submit ideas for future episodes, as well as ask questions for an upcoming episode of Question and Astle. Again, that's bonuspointspodcast.com. So let's start by talking about the concept of patron saints. Uh, What what are they and where do they come from? So like we said back at the beginning of this series, we believe that the saints intercede for us. They're in heaven. Um, They are the cloud of witnesses described in the book of Hebrews. And so they're constantly praying for us. They're asking God to help us. And so we ask them for that intercession. We ask Um, Sometimes we ask specific saints to intercede for particular intentions. Now, over time, some saints developed a reputation for interceding for particular groups' intentions or professions. Often this is connected to their lives in some way or another. So, for example, St. Nicholas uh, was an early saint who lived in the maritime city of Myra, so it became common for sailors to ask for his intercession. And so he became the patron saint of mariners because of that. Uh, We think about St. Monica, who is often invoked for the conversion or reversion of children because of her prayers for her son, St. Augustine. So very often there is a connection between a saint and that saint's life and why you would find people of a particular profession or background or intention asking that saint to intercede for them. Now, other times, there doesn't seem to be as much of a connection. For example, St. Gertrude is the patron against infestation by mice. We have St. Anthony, the patron of amputees, and St. Sebastian, the patron of athletes. And the reasons why those particular saints became those particular patrons is usually kind of convoluted. I mean, St. Anthony was not an amputee. Um, St. Sebastian was not an athlete. but there, there's usually some reason if you dig down far enough, um, but it's not always as clear as it is in other cases. So the ones we're looking at today, some of them are pretty straightforward. Once you hear the story of their lives, you'll understand immediately why they became a patron the way they did. Other times, it's not going to be as clear. So let's start with uh, talking about how a patron saint or how a saint becomes a patron saint for something in particular. Because we know that there can be multiple patron saints for a particular cause. I know, um, for example, Catholic school students have St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Jean-Baptiste de La Salle as their patrons. But there's no competition there. It's not like the two of them are elbowing each other up in heaven arguing about who gets to pray for who. So there can be multiple patron saints for a particular cause or profession. So let's back up and talk about where this comes from. This custom of having patron saints goes all the way back to the very first church communities. So before Christianity was legalized in Rome, typically the church would have to meet um, in secret, and very often that would happen in the catacombs at the tombs of the martyrs. And so when we started to build actual church buildings, We kept doing that. We would build the church over the tomb of a martyr. Um, And so it it was kind of natural to name that church after the martyr. That's why so many churches, especially in Rome, are named after martyrs, because they were built over the tombs of those martyrs. And so it became a custom for that community 
to ask that particular martyr for their intercession in a special way. It makes sense, right? They're praying at that martyr's tomb every day. Over time, that practice expanded and continued. And so you soon had churches that, um, even if they weren't built directly over the tomb of a martyr, they would be named after a saint, and that saint would be invoked in a special way by that community. And then sometimes devotion to a particular saint became popular in a certain city or country, and so that local community would declare that saint to be their patron. Over time, what you see is that devotion to these particular saints often happened in a very organic way. You know, a community meets at a particular saint's tomb, and so they ask that saint for their intercession. You have a town, maybe there's a saint from that town, and so it would make sense that those people would have a particular devotion to that saint. Now, it is possible for the church to officially declare a patron saint. Um, At the local level, that can be done by the bishop, uh, or maybe a conference of bishops can choose a patron for their entire country. That's what happened with America. Um, We have Our Lady as the Immaculate Conception as our patron saint, and that was declared by the Conference of U.S. Bishops. And it can also be declared by the Pope. For example, um, in 1870, Pope Pius IX declared St. Joseph as the patron of the Universal Church. So this is part of how you get multiple patron saints for the same causes, uh, because so much of the process happens organically, but then you can also have an official declaration. And sometimes you have both. Sometimes you have a mix of patron saints, some of whom have been officially declared, and others just kind of had that devotion grow over time. So part of the reason you get so many weird patron saints like this is because that process is so flexible and it's so organic. So what I want to do is present just um, a couple unique patron saints. I don't want to say that they're weird. Some of them might be weird. But I just want to give a very short vignette of the of the saint, just so we get an idea of who they are. And if it's not clear, maybe explain how they became the patron of whatever it is. So... Without further ado, let's dive in. We're going to start with a patron saint that we hinted at a few minutes ago, and that is Saint Monica, the patron of disappointed mothers. So Saint Monica was born in 331 in Tagaste, which uh, I think I'm saying that right. That is a town in modern Algeria. Um, She married a Roman pagan named Patricius, And then shortly after that, his mother, so her mother-in-law, moved in with them. Now, the thing is, um, both Monica's husband and mother-in-law had very bad tempers. So they would bicker. They would argue. They made life difficult for everybody around them. Now, I mentioned that Patricius was a pagan. He was okay with Monica practicing her Christian faith, but he would not let the children be baptized. And of their children... One of them, Augustine, went off to become a teacher in the big city of Carthage. Now, while he was there, he became a Manichaean, um, which was a type of Gnosticism. He had a child out of wedlock. He lived a life of frivolity and pleasure. Basically, he he became kind of a prodigal son. He went off uh, and kind of did his own thing. All the while, for the years that he was away, Monica was praying for his conversion, as well as for the conversion of her husband and her mother-in-law. One day, um, she met her bishop, St. Ambrose, and he, before they met, he saw her praying in the church, and he saw just how much she was weeping in prayer. And so he said to her, the child of such tears will never perish. In other words, there's no way that God will ignore um, Such a passionate, heartfelt prayer of a mother like this. And now Monica realized that um, Augustine valued the intellectual life. He was smart and he wanted to understand things. And she knew that she didn't really have that background. She wouldn't be able to explain things the way, in a way that would be, be satisfying for him. So she put her son in contact with the Bishop Ambrose, um, who just blows him away. Augustine is super impressed. And um, it is Ambrose who really helps bring Augustine back. And so we credit the prayers of St. Monica, not only for the conversion of her son Augustine, but eventually um, 
Her husband, Patricius, and his mother also converted to the faith. St. Monica died in 387 in Ostia, and her feast day is August 27th, which is the day before her son's. And so, hopefully it's clear, she is the patron of disappointed mothers because of her prayers, her ceaseless, her unending perseverance in praying for her son, Augustine. Our next patron saint is a fun combination. He is the patron saint of ugly people and coffee. I'm talking about Saint Drogo. Drogo was born in 1105 as an orphan. Um, You might say, how can you be born as an orphan? Well, his father died shortly before he was born, and then his mother died in childbirth. So from day one, he was raised by relatives. As a young man, Drogo renounced his wealth. Um, He came from a fairly wealthy family. He renounced all of it and became a shepherd hermit. Now, the the sad irony with hermits is they want to be left alone uh, so that they can pray. But that means they develop reputations for being holy. And so that means people seek them out. And so he became highly sought after for um, advice and spiritual counsel. He also had a lot of practical advice about medicine. He was a good shepherd, and that meant that he had knowledge of how to heal them. So this poor guy just wanted to be a hermit, but the crowds wouldn't leave him alone. So he would often go on pilgrimages to try to get away from people, um, which only increased his reputation for holiness because they said, wow, look how holy he is. He's always going on pilgrimages. Over time, he also developed a reputation for being able to bilocate, which means he was seen in two places at the same time. And in fact, his reputation in town for bilocation became so prominent that there was even a local saying that that became popular as a result, where people would say, I'm not St. Drogo, I can't ring the bell for mass and be in the procession, which is, that's pretty cool, right? Um, Eventually, he left the fields, he left the sheepfold. In order to be more um, more in tune with the church, closer to the church, so he built a very small cell next to the church um, with two windows in it. One of them uh, was on the church side so that he could watch the liturgy and receive the Eucharist. And then there was a window on the outside that would let things be passed back and forth. Um, but in terms of food, he would, by the end of his life, he lived only on the Eucharist, uh, barley that was donated to him and a cup of warm water every day. Eventually, he died in 1186, and his feast day is April 16th. Now, you might be saying, I'm not sure why he's the patron of ugly people. We're not sure either. Um, Most accounts say that he eventually developed a disease that left him disfigured, um, which I suppose would make sense. And if anything, it's proof that even if you don't look that attractive. People will still follow you um, because at the end of the day, holiness is the most attractive thing. So we have on the one hand, this story that says he was disfigured. And on the other hand, a story that says people wouldn't stop following him. So I could see both of those being true. The more interesting one, in my opinion, is why he's the patron of coffee and all those associated with it from those who grow coffee to those who prepare and serve it. Because he died 400 years before coffee ever reached Europe. In fact, it's unclear whether coffee had even been invented at the time Drogo was around. It certainly was not something he ever would have encountered. He wasn't a farmer. It's not like he um, was the patron of other hot beverages and coffee kind of got lumped in there over time. So we have no idea. The, the actual reason why Drogo's the patron of coffee is entirely lost to history. Um, The most compelling theory that I've heard is because at the end of his life, all he was consuming uh, was the Eucharist, donated barley, and that cup of warm water. It's possible that that part was unique enough that he became kind of a, a patron of hot beverages. That seems like kind of a stretch, but it's honestly the best explanation that I've heard. I'm sure that the, the real reason is out there, but unfortunately has been lost. Our next patron saint is one of those saints who's fairly well known, especially in France and especially, especially in Paris, Uh, but we actually don't know a whole lot about him. I'm talking about Saint Denis of Paris, the patron saint of headaches and those who suffer from them. 
So we don't know much about his early life. We know that he was born in the early 200s in Italy. And in 250 AD, he was sent to Gaul, modern France, as a missionary along with five other bishops. They all kind of um, chose their home bases where they would start evangelizing. And Dennis chose a city called Lutetia Parisiorum, um, which would eventually become the city of Paris. And so this makes him the first bishop of Paris. In 258, he and his companions were imprisoned and beheaded. Yes, that is why St. Dennis is the patron of headaches, because he was martyred by beheading. Pretty neat, huh? Um, There's also a legend, and this might have been part of it, of all the saints who have been beheaded, why is he the patron of headaches? There's a legend that says that after he was beheaded, he picked up his head and carried it for several miles while still preaching. So if nothing else, that that's a good way to get your name out there when it comes to patron saints. Anyway, his feast day is October 9th. And as you'd expect, in addition to being the patron of headaches, he is also, also one of the patron saints of France and of the city of Paris. This next one is one of my favorites. He is the patron saint of airline pilots, St. Joseph of Cupertino. And just like St. Drogo, he lived several hundred years before the thing that he's a patron of even existed. Um, He was born in 1603, which for those playing along at home is exactly 300 years before the first powered heavier than air flight. Um, He was born in Cupertino, which was a city in Italy. And growing up, he had a reputation for being stupid, clumsy, ill-tempered, and absent-minded. His biographers said that he would walk around with his mouth hanging open, he would forget what he was doing, and just drop whatever was in his hands, and he often would pick fights with people. I, I don't like when people look back and try to diagnose historical figures, but I have a feeling if this guy were around today, he'd probably be diagnosed something. Um, But in any case, he wanted to be a Franciscan. He went first to the Capuchin Franciscans, uh, but left after a few weeks. And so his mother went to the Conventuals, which is another branch of the Franciscan order, and asked if they would hire him as a lay servant. Even if they didn't take him in as a friar, uh, maybe they would let him just help out around the friary. And they did. Um, They hired him as a lay servant. He helped out, especially with taking care of the stables. And over time, um, it was clear that the Holy Spirit was starting to bear fruit in him. He mellowed out. He still wasn't anything that we would call book smart. But um, that temper kind of went away a little bit, and and he became known for his holiness. And so the Franciscans did accept him. They let him into the order. He struggled incredibly with his exams, um, but eventually did passed the seminary, and was ordained as a deacon and then a priest. As a priest, he developed, um, he especially developed a reputation for holiness, and on over 40 occasions, he was seen levitating during prayer, um, sometimes a few feet off the ground, sometimes all the way up to the rafters, but he was so caught up in, in ecstasy while he prayed that he would often be, and not even just, you know, one person told someone else that they saw him. No, it was witnessed by his entire community on many occasions where he would levitate during prayer. He died in 1663 and later was declared the patron saint of airline pilots. And yes, it's because of the levitation. He is also the patron saint of test takers. Um, As my students know well, we often ask for his intercession before a test. And he is the patron of test takers because he struggled so much with his academics. Um, there's a story where he, he knew he wouldn't be able to study everything that he um, had to study. So he, he knew they were going to ask him three questions. So he only studied three of the questions that he was preparing for. And it just so happened those were the three questions that he was asked. And so there is a prayer today to St. Joseph of Cupertino, the patron of test takers, that asks through his intercession um, that we may receive a similar grace to only be asked the questions that we know. Another fun fact about St. Joseph of Cupertino, 
the city of Cupertino, California, is named after him. Um, like many of the places that were settled by Franciscans, especially in California, this place was named after a Franciscan saint. Here's a bonus one for you. While we're on the subject of airline pilots, there is another patron saint of aviators, and that is Our Lady of Loretto. As you'd expect, Our Lady hints that this is one of the titles we have for Mary, um, and Loretto is a town in Italy. So what's the connection here? If you go to Loretto, Italy, you will find a church called the Basilica of the Holy House. And it's one of those neat churches that has another building inside of it, because if you go into the Basilica, you will find the remains of a first century house that was once occupied by the Holy Family. This is the house that Jesus grew up in, the house that um, Mary and Joseph raised the Holy Child in, and it's, it's there in Loretto, Italy. And you might know this, probably know this, the Holy Family didn't live in Italy. So um, what gives? Well, for that, we have to go back. The year 1291, the Holy Land is about to fall to the Turks. According to the traditional story, Mary appeared along with a platoon of angels, and the angels picked up the house and carried it to Loretto, where it would be safe. Um, now, here's, here's an interesting part. We also have a shipping manifest from 1291 that shows a family with the surname Angeli um, shipping the pieces of what seems to be a house to Loretto, Italy. And Angeli is, in both Latin and Italian, angels. So either way, we can say uh, with some certainty that the angels move the house from the Holy Land to Loretto. The church hasn't weighed in, so we are free to believe either variation of the story, that it was um, it was a miraculous event or a more natural event. Heck, it could be a little bit of both. Um, but in any case, the stones that make up the house do match stones that you would find in Nazareth, and the building techniques are fitting for the area in the first century. Certainly not what you would expect for a house built in Italy in the 13th century. So because, according to the traditional story, Mary flew her house out of harm's way, um, she's often asked to intercede for pilots under the title Our Lady of Loretto. We mentioned a moment ago that it was kind of weird that um, St. Drogo was the patron of coffee because he lived centuries before coffee reached Europe. And St. Joseph of Cupertino is the patron of airline pilots, even though he lived 300 years before airline pilots existed. Well, this next one's kind of in the same vein. The 13th century St. Clair of Assisi is the patron saint of television. So St. Clair is probably one of the more well-known names on this list because of her association with St. Francis of Assisi, uh, who's perhaps the most well-known saint. Um, St. Clair also holds a special place in my heart, in part because her feast day is also our wedding anniversary. But anyway, she was born in 1194, and as a young woman, she heard St. Francis preaching and asked him to help her live the gospel poverty like he was. Even though it was against her family's wishes, she renounced her wealth, cut her hair, and started living in one of the chapels that Francis had rebuilt. Over time, other women started joining her, so along with St. Francis, she founded the Poor Clares, Order of Franciscans. She died in 1253 at age 59. What does any of that have to do with TV? Well, her attachment to television comes from a story that occurred near the end of her life. Um, she was sick in bed, and so she was una unable to attend Christmas Mass with the friars like she usually would. But she had a vision where she was able to watch Mass happening on her wall. She was looking at her wall and could see the Mass happening. And so Pope Pius XII declared her the patron saint of television in 1958. Our last one is similar to the patron of TV, and that's St. Isidore of Seville, the patron saint of the internet. Isidore was born in the mid to late 550s in Spain. He was naturally intelligent and worked very hard at his education. Eventually, he became the bishop and used that role to promote education to others as well. For example, he made sure that every diocese had a seminary, and he made sure that those seminaries taught a variety of subjects, not just philosophy and theology. He wrote, 
an absolutely incredible volume about a wide range of subjects. Um, and when I say an incredible volume, I mean many, many, many different writings, not just one massive book. He wrote about theology, grammar, astronomy, geography, history, biographies. But his most famous work is an encyclopedia called Etymologies or Origins. This book, even today, is just, it's incredible for how much it includes. Um, it even incorporated many classical works that had been lost otherwise um, in the so-called Dark Ages. We're going to do an episode at some point on the Dark Ages because there are so many misconceptions about it. But in any case, um, Isidore was able to preserve many of these classical works of literature by including them in his encyclopedia. Now, this book became the go-to textbook for hundreds of years. I'm going to have a link to it in the show notes if you want to check it out for yourself. But Isidore eventually died around age 80 in the year 636. And so because of his effort to compile human knowledge and make that knowledge accessible to others, uh, he was kind of a natural patron saint of the internet. And I'm calling it now Blessed Carlo Acutis, who will be a saint one day. I'm, I mean, it's not even a question. He's probably also going to be declared a patron saint of the internet. Um, but maybe a little bit more, in a way that's a little bit more relevant to his life because he actually lived in a time with the internet. Now, before we wrap up, I do want to throw a quick bonus um, at you. This one is not, we're not going to talk fully about this, but one of the most well-known patron saints, even among people who otherwise don't know what a patron saint is, is St. Anthony as the patron of lost things. Even people who don't know any other patron saints know that if you lose something, you need to ask St. Anthony to help you find it. Um, growing up, that was our go-to response anytime we lost something, was pray to St. Anthony. I still do that every time I lose something. Uh, my favorite form of the prayer is the one that rhymes. It goes, Dear St. Anthony, come around. Something's lost and must be found. So why is it that this... Um, early Franciscan friar from the 1200s became the patron of lost items. Well, St. Anthony had a book of the Psalms that he had copied by hand himself, and to it he had added his own reflections and notes, and he used this a lot to teach. So in an era before books were able to be printed and they had to be hand copied, you would understand that books were hard to come by. Especially, and that's not even counting the fact that he'd added all of his own thoughts and reflections and course notes, this book would be irreplaceable. Even if it wasn't for his notes, just having a copy of the Psalms like that was incredible. So one day there was a young disgruntled friar who decided to leave the order, and unbeknownst to Anthony, he took the book with him. Now, Anthony realizes the book is missing. He has his suspicions that the former friar took it, but he has no way to prove it, and he has no idea where the guy went. So there's no way he's going to be able to track him down and get this book back. But he did pray. He prayed that the young man would have a change of heart and bring his book back, and he did. He returned the book um, and returned to the order at the same time. And so that is how St. Anthony became the patron saint of lost items. By the way, you can still see the book at a Franciscan monastery in Bologna, Italy. All right, well, that'll do it for today. There are so many more patron saints out there. I'm including a list in the show notes so that you can find your patron saints. Find patron saints for your professions, your hopeful professions, your region, your interests, whatever it is, and start asking those saints to intercede for you. That's what they do, right? As always, make sure you share this episode with somebody you think would enjoy it. Share the show with someone who's never heard of it. Make sure you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. In terms of resources, I have a few good links to throw at you this time. I have the list of patron saints that I mentioned a second ago, as well as a link to the Catholic Encyclopedia's entry on patron saints. I have links to profiles of each of the saints we mentioned today, an article about the Holy House of Loretto, a link to a complete version of St. Isidore's Etymologies, and an article that tells the story of St. Anthony's missing book. You can find all of those show notes on our website, bonuspointspodcast.com. 
That's going to do it for today's episode of Bonus Points. I'm Mr. Astle. Thank you for joining us once again as we continue every episode to put out into the deep, exploring the world of theology and beyond.